Hello everybody! Welcome back to the final video of our series, Introduction to Environmental and Natural Sciences. Again, my name is Sam, and if you haven't already, go watch the four previous videos because today is our last one, as I said before, on aquatic biomes. Everyone's favorite, like the ocean, the lakes, the rivers, we'll get into all that stuff in the following video. Okay. So, if you haven't watched the first video, go back and watch it so you'll understand these new terms because remember from the first day how I talked about ecosystem services and how they can be applied to any kind of like environmental aspect or region? Here it is for coral reefs. So, um, coral reefs obviously is one of the most common aquatic, um, coral reefs are actually in the most um, infamous like aquatic biomes in the ocean. And so a provisioning act, remember the three or the five F's, like the pharmaceuticals, even though it's a pH, food, fiber, fuel, all that good stuff, is that it provides commercial fisheries, so like food, even though that starts with an F2, that kind of works out perfectly. So commercial fisheries obtained from healthy reefs, so people can make profit off of these reefs, and you know that's how they make their living, and that's how humans are surviving. Um, a regulating services, you know, those regulating um, the environment, the protection of beach and coastlines from storm surges and waves. That's really important that those beaches and coastlines are there. So, you know, the humans and other types of species as well do not get harmed from these powerful storm surges and waves. And, you know, that's actually prone to change because of these um, more severe storms in the future due to climate change. But we'll get into that later. Um some cultural aspects um, is tourism and recreation. So, for example, people like to go snorkeling, people like to go scuba diving, people like to go swimming in the ocean, um, and stuff like that. Then finally, supporting is the nursery habitats. Coral reefs are actually um, animals, and they provide habitats for other animals, and so they form this symbiotic relationship. So another um, really common aquatic biome is wetlands, and these are not um, as well known. So they actually work as a natural water filter, which is exactly what we need because remember how um, in the land and water usage video I talked about how, you know, only like a teaspoon of water would be able to fit, fresh water would be able to fit in a two liter bottle of the whole entire water sy system. And so we really need these wetlands to preserve them to act as that natural water filter so we don't have to do it ourselves and use more um, industrialization to do that. And then it also stores carbon dioxide. So we need that for that um, nutrient cycling. So yeah, um, ecosystems just in general for aquatic biomes include like climate moderation. They really control the our climate and the nutri nutrient cycling, like I said, um, and etc. And this picture to the right is um, just one image of a wetlands. It's a pretty broad term. If you look it up, you'll see a bunch of different just bodies of water. Okay, so now, rather than ecosystem services, we're going to look at more of the financial and economic aspect because that also is very important as well. So just to go back to coral reefs because it's a pretty um, simple example. Um, is that there's at least 94 countries and territories that benefit from tourism. And just to give you a rough estimate, I believe there's 195 or 96 countries in the world. So a lot of them, a good majority of them, benefit from this reef tourism. And in 23 of these 94 countries and territories, reef tourism accounts for more than 15% of the GDP. And GDP, if you're not familiar with economics, is the gross domestic product. And so approximately 53,800 full-time employment jobs contribute to Australia's economy for the Great Barrier Reef. And that's, you know, that's a lot of jobs in just one um, continent. That's a lot of jobs. And then the total net benefit per year of the world's coral reef is $29.8 billion. So yeah, these, this uh, um, attribute is really important to our world and our system. Okay, so now instead of coral reefs, I'm going to go into some other aquatic biomes that you're probably not as familiar with. So here is an image in the right hand corner as of an estuary. So defined, an estuary is a partially enclosed coastal body, coastal water body where fresh water from rivers and streams 
mixes with salt water from the ocean. So it's commonly known as where river meets the sea. So it's basically where this fresh water and salt water are mixing together. So some services that estuaries provided um, places for recreational activities, scientific study, and aesthetic enjoyment. So, you know, we can enjoy um, fishing, we can enjoy just being, just embracing nature, I guess. Um, a lot of field research does or is conducted in these estuaries, and again, aesthetic enjoyment. And so there's irreplaceable natural resource that must be managed carefully for the mutual benefit of all who enjoy and depend on them. So again, just really appropriately using our resources, and that's a big theme in all of these videos. Okay, so next we're going to talk about a watershed, which is a picture right here. And it's also commonly referred to as a drainage basin, so either one works perfectly. So it's basically an entire river system. It's an area drained by a river and its tributaries. Um, and it covers wide areas, so it's very large. Um, and the largest in the United States is the Mississippi River watershed, and I believe it's the fourth largest in the world. Um, and so, you know, we need this water to, you know, contribute to the flow of our environment and our ecosystems. So agriculture impacted as water quality has worsened. So what I mean by this is because agricultural, um, agriculture has enhanced to provide more food to the world, um, the water quality has worsened. Just for example, like if we need to use um, fertilizers on our soil to make it more nutrient rich, that some of that fertilizer can run off into the water and contaminate it and worsen that water quality. Or another example would be like um, using pesticides on crops that could also run off and just be really detrimental to the water quality as well. So it's really important that we make sure this water quality is good for our use, not only our use, but for just like the good of like the environment. And also when these things happen, when the water quality is damaged, that typically means the BOD or like the dis dissolved oxygen um, is a result of something called cultural eutrophication, which is a big word for basically the lack of oxygen in water. Um, and it's just a bunch of algae blooms will occur and more bacteria will happen and a bunch of chemicals like phosphates and nitrates will happen as well. And, you know, that's not what we want. We don't want our water to be green. We want it to be, like, clear, you know. We don't want it to be infested with bacteria. So it's really important that we um, keep our water quality just good. Okay. So, major threats to freshwater ecosystems. I want you guys to pause the video and think if you can think of um, any major threats to freshwater ecosystems. Fantastic job. I'm sure you came up with so many good ones. So, these are just ones I came up with. So, the biggest threat to, honestly, anything in environmental science is human activities. So, like, dam development, that restricts the the migration of like salmon for instance they can't get from point a to point b city sewage um there are two different types of categories there's called point source contamination and i like to think of this as you can point to the source and you can determine what's being contaminated so for an example this could be like a pipeline like you could see um contaminants coming out of a pipeline or overflow of metropolitan zones then a non-point source contamination would just be like a whole something you can't quickly identify as a contaminant. So this is a lot harder to trace, obviously. An example of this would just be like um, a body of water just contaminated and you just like don't know where it's from. So besides human activities, those make up like two, roughly two thirds of like the major threats, so the majority. But then also habitat modification, fragmentation, and destruction. Those kind of all go hand in hand and tie together, but yeah, that's also kind of a human activity because it's deforestation, basically, and um, not naturally, but like man-made altering these naturally occurring habitats, which is very detrimental. Um, invasive species to these freshwater ecosystems, you know, that's always not good because it throws off the trophic pyramid, which I talked about in my first video. Um, overfishing, you know, that's also a major issue. I know some people um, enjoy to go fishing just for like 
recreational purposes, but sometimes it's really bad for that to happen because, you know, if we overfish, then there's not going to be any fish left, and as a result, um, you know, that's just going to cause trophic cascade again, and so what governments sometimes do is provide subsidies or tax reductions on, like, overfishing. Forestry practice is another major threat to freshwater ecosystems. Um, because, you know, it just kind of throws off everything forestry practice. It throws off nutrient cycling, it throws off biodiversity levels. And then finally, and probably just most commonly, is climate change. Um, those temperature levels are going to fluctuate as well as the amount of wa actual water in these ecosystems. Um, and yeah. Next, we're going to talk about ocean acidification. So, ocean acidification is the ongoing decrease of pH levels in the ocean, and pH is the potential amount of hydrogen ions, so it's a lot of chemistry that goes into it. But, um, so the rising levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere really contribute to this, because again, as I said in one of my previous videos, is that, um, the ocean is the biggest reservoir for carbon dioxide. It actually absorbs 30 to 40 percent of it, so roughly half. So that's a lot. And oh, just to clarify, um, the decrease of pH levels means it's going to be more acidic because it's on a scale of um, 1 to 14, and 7 is neutral, and that's like pure water. But then anything from like 1 to 7 is acidic, and anything from 7 to 14 is considered basic or alkaline. Same thing. Um, and so, just in case, I didn't know if you guys are taking chemistry or just enjoy it, but here's the chemical equation. It's carbon dioxide plus water, um, and then those are the reactants, the products are carbonic. The product is carbonic acid. So this has a dramatic effect on pretty much everything, but most directly on fish, oysters, clams, sea urchins, sea corals, etc. Then at the bottom, I put a little diagram of, um... Just like the process of ocean acidification, so to the left, we start in the atmosphere with atmospheric carbon dioxide, you know, from, you know, cellular respiration, from fossil fuels, from industrialization, you know, all that good stuff. Then it goes into the ocean, and then it turns into um, the dissolved carbon dioxide, so the carbon goes in the water, so that's where you get the carbon dioxide in the water from. Then those um, form and they combine and they get carbonic acid, which is H2CO3. And then all this chemical stuff happens and it forms these bicarbonate ions, which if you don't take chemistry, it's all good. So, um, you know, you're gonna have an anion and a cation, which is just a positive and negative. And then it just creates these um, ions that basically um, make the ocean more acidic, and then it can cause, like, for instance, it says on the diagram, deformed shells of these corals, and it also results in coral bleaching, because, you know, when we think of coral reefs, we think of these vibrant colors, these this beautiful array of coral. However, with ocean acidification, that color's going to go away, because it's going to be more acidic, so it's going to take the color away, and it's going to turn white as a result. Okay, so now we're going to do a little activity. I know it's kind of blurry, but... Um, I thought this would be a good of a kind of like summarization for the things we talked about. So, aquatic biomes identify the characteristics of different aquatic biomes and use the clues to fill in the blanks in the correct biomes. So, the first one is, this biome is generally found in clear tropical oceans. Some animals that could be found here are sea urchins, shrimp, worms, and rays. So our options are freshwater, marine, Coral reef, freshwater wetlands, and estuaries. I'll give you a moment to think about it. Hmm. What's in clear oceans that we can see with these sea urchins? Fantastic job. It's going to be the coral reefs because, you know, the tropical, we think of like, I just, this is how I do it. I think of like fruity, so I think of lots of color, and then that's what I was just talking about on the previous slide. So, yeah, coral reefs. The next one, this is the largest biome in the world. There are over 1 million different types of plants in this biome. So now our options are freshwater, marine, freshwater wetlands, or estuaries. What would be the largest biome? Fantastic job. It's going to be the marine biome because um, there's actually, why can't I think of the name of it? Hmm, there's this law that 
um, we formed in order to protect, oh my gosh, marine protected areas. It's literally so self-explanatory. That's what it is. Marine protected areas to conserve because, you know, we really need it since it's the largest biome in the world. And um, we want to conserve these areas so that we don't overuse them and, you know, go check out my previous video where I talked about tragedy of the commons because that could happen here as well. Okay, the next one is this biome is not connected to the ocean not connected. There are often floating plants found here along with many different kinds of amphibians. Amphibian, yep. So, you guessed it, it's the freshwater wetlands because it's not connected to the ocean which signifies that it's not gonna have salt water. Um, an estuary contains salt water and um, fresh water is just fresh water but yeah, good job. So this biome includes rivers, lakes, and streams. Hmm, is it going to be freshwater or estuaries? You completely guessed it. It's going to be the freshwater, right? Then finally, that leaves the last one as estuaries, as where the um, river meets the sea. The seawater and freshwater mix together in this biome, and pickleweed is a plant with special adaptations to live here. Interesting. Okay. So I really wanted to emphasize the interconnectedness between, you know, ecosystems, biodiversity, land and water usage, um, global air circulation and climate, and finally aquatic biomes. So aquatic biomes are ecosystems. Yes, they are composed of both biotic and abiotic factors. They have a large array of biodiversity. So example, the coral reefs that has a multitude of plants and animals. And we must regulate water level levels to keep ecological balance and as well to maintain that good and fresh water quality. And then the ocean acidity raises the um, global temperatures. So as global temperatures increase, that means more carbon dioxide, that means more ocean acidification will occur. And this affects the overall climate levels. And here is just a graph of, um, we see on the x-axis, the different years from 19, 100 to 2100 then we have the surface ph ranging from 7.6 to 8.2 which is basic right because it's above six and then you can see that it's exponentially decreasing the ph from going from what it normally is at like eight around like 8.15 to like 8.2 and now it's exponentially decreasing in all of these biomes the aquatic or arctic southern ocean tropics everywhere around the world it's decreasing as a result of climate change which is really scary okay so what can you do you can in order to solve these problems you can reduce your meat consumption and eat on a lower trophic level on the pyramid or the trophic pyramid because i'm not saying like go vegetarian go vegan because that doesn't necessarily work either. i mean it does work it's been proven to work if you don't have to go that far just, just try not to eat um oh here's a fact to produce one pound of beef it requires two thousand gallons of water just one pound of beef so honestly just reduce your beef consumption and just like steak and just those like richer meats like chicken and turkey definitely isn't as bad it doesn't require as much water but like just try to reduce that meat consumption because personally i'm not even vegetarian or um vegan i just try to reduce my meat consumption just to know i'm doing something so another thing you can do is utilize an appropriate amount of water for your household just making sure you're not like overusing like water just to conserve it more you can put solar panels on your roof to use that solar energy rather than generate electricity from like coal or nuclear power plants or um, natural gas. Um, you really just need to be aware of where you're buying products from and seeing what they do and what they support. Do they do non-GMOs? Do they use BPA? Do they use these different things that are harmful for the environment or good for the environment? So just really just do your research and be aware of... Um, what you're doing and where you're buying products from um and then also you just want to stay updated with scientific studies and discoveries because i feel like this is the most important because without these scientific studies and discoveries and just um field research in general is really important because without it we're not going to know what to do so just stay updated and just keep learning more science so that you can understand why these problems are arising then with all of this makes a happy earth as i always say so i will most likely be doing a second series um to this introduction in environmental and natural sciences because this was honestly like a third 
of what I would like to cover. So I will probably be doing more of these in the future. And with all of that, I hope you guys have a fantastic day or night whenever you're watching this. And I hope to see you guys in the future. Just remember to totally ask me any questions. Um, and if you just have any thoughts or suggestions, just please let me know in the comments below. And I really appreciate you guys for listening to this. And I hope to see you in the future. Bye.